How's it going ladies and Bruce? I'm Bobby Sixkiller and today we're going to be checking out a game called Stillwater. This is a free to play game that just came out on uh, Steam today as of time of recording, 7th of September. I had no idea it was coming out, I just saw it on the new releases page and I thought this looks really good. It's like a detective noir uh, visual novel. It says it's got two endings. Imagine it's probably pretty short, uh, but it is free to play. So I'd like to give it a go anyway, see what we think. Shall we jump into it? It's got a pretty nice looking uh, aesthetic anyway. Oh, this is definitely made in Remplay. Well, I can't say definitely, but it certainly looks like it. It's the same normal... Yeah, maybe not, maybe not, I don't know. Hard to say, in it? Oh, we can change our... Change our font, that's very cool. Hmm. Interesting, anyway, let's jump in, shall we? This is a work of fiction. The resemblance to any real-life people is purely coincidental. This game contains depictions of horror, mature themes, violence, and strong language for your discretion is advised. As always. I'm sorry, but I can't stay here anymore, Nina. I feel like I'm going crazy. Calm down. If we could just talk it out. So many strange things keep happening after another. Every day there's this damn dripping sound. I thought it was just something leaking at first, but... I check every faucet. Every ceiling. Every pipeline. And still... Still, I hear it everywhere, constantly echoing in my ears. Oh, but the water. I find random pools of water just appearing out of nowhere, look, just like the dripping. But it's at night. It's at night when it comes. I don't know if it's my paranoia, but I swear I could hear footsteps walking along the hallways, walking on pools of water. They walk. And they walk. Upstairs, then downstairs. Upstairs, downstairs. Upstairs, downstairs. And, so, and it goes on, and on, and on, and on, like that. But somehow, it does come to an end. And it ends. All in front of your grandfather's room. I know that this is a lot, but you have to believe me. No matter how many times I clean, it just won't end. I can't stay here any longer. I'm sorry, Nina. It's okay. I understand. Thank you for taking care of my grandfather. Nina, please listen to me. I don't know what's happening around here, but... The woman on the phone cautiously looks around before speaking again in a hushed tone. Something terrible is lurking through this house. I don't know what it is, but please, as soon as you get back, take your grandfather and just leave this place. I can't just leave, that's my home. Please, Nina, this place, it's not safe. I don't know what you saw, but I can't just leave things like this. It's my home. It's my home. Di Diner. Amid a foggy morning, there sits a man by the corner of a booth. He drinks black coffee and depending on his mood, occasionally orders a donut. And today, it was just black coffee. Ugh. I swear I've never seen that amount of paperwork in my life. A freaking mountain worth of it. You're a valuable member of our team, Hugo. My foot. I'm starting to believe that I was bamboozled into joining their agency. Huh. Hugo Laurent, age 30, takes a good look at his cup of joe and chugs it all in one sitting. And then he continues to grumble to himself about last night's gruelling work at the office. I really need to find a different job. As he contemplates his poor life choices, he looks out toward the early mist. There was something inherently terrifying about the fog to him, how it engulfs everything and nothing. Even if it disappears, it always leaves behind traces. Proof of it remaining. Even in a quaint town like this, I can't even run from my fate, I guess. Hugo finally stares at the complied newspaper clippings he put together. Compiled, sorry. Some of them from recent events, but mainly all were past headlines of missing person cases. No matter how many times I see this, it's still just as hard to look at it. This is a great art style, by the way. Really like it. Fixating case after case, he can't help but remind himself that there was a there is a reason for all of this. An all too personal reason. Seeing strange things come with a price. In the end, I'm the one doing this to myself. Sounds rough. Why if I join you? An annoyingly familiar voice interrupts his train of thought. He slowly looks up to see one res the one responsible, although reluctantly. Good morning, Hugo. Hugo scowls and turns away from him. Then he gathers the files and shoves it back into the binder. Meanwhile, the tall man takes this as an initiative and sits at the opposite end of the booth. He greets the waitress, 
passing by and orders himself the hefty body breakfast special with an extra plate. As usual, the waitress is happy to oblige and goes back to the counter to relay his order. The man then looks back at Hugo. He sees the empty cup and the now jumbled newspaper clippings, all the while Hugo is trying to ignore him. You really should eat something with that black coffee. No ordering any don not ordering any donuts today? I'm fine, Noah. Just not the mood, okay? Not even a little? There is a momentary silence between them before Noah disturbs it once more. Well, too bad for you, I ordered a big breakfast for the two of us. Two? As if the world could grace Noah with an even more perfect punchline, the food arrives. Why the hell did you order for two of us? Just eat what you want, don't worry about me. Wow, this looks so delicious. Right, Hugo? Are you even listening to me? Come on, we both know that if you don't eat now, eat now, who knows when you will. And I'm not about to let you faint again. So open wide. Here comes the aeroplane. Noah de Leon, age 27, natural born charmer. He is just as equally persuasive as he is threatening. Threatening? He doesn't seem threatening. With a pensive look, Hugo finally gives in and eats the generous spoonful without further complaints. It's good. Right? Good food will always help cheer you up. Damn him, I got swept away again. Oh, by the way, the chief will be out for a business trip. She mentioned it would be for a couple of days. When did she tell you this? I didn't hear anything about it. Mm, yesterday, I think? Yesterday? She told me to sort out the cabinets yesterday. She didn't mention anything about a business trip. I guess it was a pretty sudden one. Well, I mean, she did tell me to tell you. And lucky me, I know where you go every morning. You know what? I'm not surprised anymore. Well, what do you want to do? We technically have the day off. I'm going to head back to the office. There's a couple of boxes I didn't get a chance to sort out. In that case, I'll come with you. Why? You can just rest for the day. And pass up the opportunity to get you know, to know you better? Quit it. After their enlightening banter, the two of them finish their breakfast, pay for their meals, and head to Hugo's car. As Noah opens the door to the passenger seat, he notices a bloodhound sleeping inside. The big dog stirs at the sound of the car opening, and lazily stares at Noah. Ah, I'm sorry, big guy. He then closes the door, while trying not to make too much noise, to disturb its occupant. Colby. At the sound of his name, his heavily lidded eyes slowly peek to see who calls for him. It is his one and only partner. His human. As if finally realising who he is or where he is, the old bloodhound stirs up from his sleep, pounces at Hugo and proceeds to wag his tail uncontrollably. Had a nice nap? Colby? Eight years old. Hugo's most faithful and loving partner in crime. Has the biggest tendency to just sleep all over the place. Noah, who was witnessing all of this from the back seat, chuckles to himself. He's amazed and slightly defeated at Hugo's sudden surge of energy. <laughs> doesn't matter how many times I try. When it comes to boosting his mood, no one can beat Colby. Agency, 7.50am. That's so early. <laughs> The three head, headed back to the office, the space just the same as Hugo left it. A decent, organised mess. To his credit, for the amount of boxes he painstakingly went through, he believes he did a fair job. Albeit could have been better. Wow, you really did outdid yourself, Hugo. It looks less crowded. Ah, oh, shut up, will you? I said I was going to get to it. Thanks, boy. Before Hugo can continue to give deserved head pats, he notices someone. A woman stands timidly peering outside from the storefront. The woman appears a bit frantic. Dishevelled and wearing ill-fitting clothes, she appears to be distressed about something. When she finally makes eye contact with Hugo, she immediately rushes in. I I'm so sorry. I know that the clothes sign is up, but I saw you come in and I... Are you alright, miss? I need your help. My grandfather... Before she can continue, Noah swiftly intervenes. It's okay. We hear what you have to say. So please, why don't you take a seat? Noah gestures to one of the empty chairs. The poor woman hesitates for a moment before heavily sighing in relief. She then walks toward the corner of the room and sits on a sofa. Can you start off by telling us your name? I'm sorry for earlier. My name is Nina Mortimer. I need help watching over my grandfather tonight. Watching over your grandfather? Yes. I'm sorry, Miss Mortimer, I don't quite understand. Is he in danger? I'm afraid he is. Miss Mortimer, if that's the case, wouldn't contacting the police be better? No. 
I've tried requesting their help, but they gave me all the same answer. There's nothing they can do about it. If only they knew who Lewis was. Lewis? Nina fidgets at the name. She looks to the side before reaching from, reaching out from her bag for an antique letter. My grandfather. He received a cryptic message the other day. It didn't quite come with an. It didn't come with an address or the name of the sender. However, the only thing I did pick up was that name. As she hands over the letter, Hugo notices her hand slightly shaking. Whatever lies in this note must have shaken her this badly. Delicately, Hugo removes the contents of the envelope and unfolds it. At first glance, it seems like any normal written message. A person named Lewis asking the other, Henry, to come meet him by the lake at midnight, needing to share something important with him. However, what's eerily striking about this letter is not the message itself. Rather, at the bottom of the page, a sentence far more disturbing is written. I am coming for you, Henry. Were there any other letters like this? Yes, a few of them. I thought it was just a sick joke at first, but this one, this one was different. Up until now, I've never heard of anyone by that name. Not a relative or family friend, but they clearly know who my grandfather is. If I don't do something about this, I'll lose, I'll lose him too. Just by uttering the words alone, Nina breaks down. Hiding away her tear-streaked face, she begins to quietly sob to herself. As an act of comfort, Colby sits closely to Nina, while Noah fetches tissues for her. Hugo, on the other hand, is puzzled. This very well could be a, could have been a prank, but she seems certain. Certain that whoever or whatever this Lewis person is, they're coming. Do you want more tissues? I'll do it. I'll take on your case. For a moment, silence fills the room. Only stares were di are directed at Hugo until Nina finally stands up and walks toward him. You'll take it? Hugo simply nods. Thank you. Thank you. You don't know how much this means to me. We're glad to help, miss. Nina. Nina is fine. Well, Nina, we'll do our best. Nina slightly smiles at Hugo before reaching into her bag once more and taking out a note. This is my address. I'll be sure to greet you once we get there, detective. She politely bows once more before heading to her car and drives back home. Once out of sight, Hugo turns to look at his cluttered desk. Still messy, but presentable. I guess I have to sort these out again later. Car, 5.30pm. From the ongoing downpour to the quiet hums of the car, they sit in silence. Still miles off from their destination, Hugo constantly checks the rearview mirror. Noah, who usually chats his ear off by now, still sits completely still. He looks out to the passing streetlights, reserved and distant. Hey, you're a lot quieter than usual. What's wrong? <laughs> this is surprising. Have you been looking at me, Hugo? No, you idiot. You usually just talk a lot, that's all. So, do you miss me talking a lot? Just say it. I didn't want to offend Nina earlier, so I kept quiet until she finished. But it's her last name that caught me off guard. Have you heard about the Mortimers? They're a pretty distinguished family. Well, they used to be. What do you mean? They've been struck with so many tragedies that over time people began to believe they were cursed or something. Every other year I would see a headline on the local news about one of their family members' deaths. And you know what's strange? All of them have been labelled as accidents. No foul play, no nothing. Just another unfortunate event for the family. Maybe I understand why she wouldn't go to the police. She probably thought that they'd perceive her as paranoid or hysterical, or worse, crazy. I can't imagine all of this for Nina. And most of all, who knows what we'll find there. Is that why you decided to come with me? Well, partially. I'm more worried about you, though. Think of it this way. I'm the appointed driver. When you decide to do some pretty reckless shit, I'll be there to drive you to the local hospital. <sighs> Besides, two are better than one. Exactly. Oh shit, I missed that one. Well, have you heard this that three is better than two? Ugh. Mortimer Estate, 6 p.m. Passing through countless dirt roads and steep cliffs, the estate reveals itself beyond the evergreen. Nestled and tucked away from prying eyes, it stands tall, looming from a distance. Hugo and Noah could only gaze at the sheer scale of the manor as they parked adjacent to Nina's car. Wow, and to think she came all this way just to request us. Took more than a couple hours to get here. Maybe she really didn't have a choice. What do you mean? Come on. She's waiting for us. 
Immediately after exiting the driver's seat, a sudden sharp pain weighs heavily on Hugo's chest. Grasping tightly at his coat, he begins to grasp for air. His gaze hazes as he leans close to the car. Like a fish drawn out from the sea, he desperately heaves. But this ache he harbours pales in comparison to a pain far more excruciating. Is it the house? No, something far more sinister. He feels it. Someone is watching him. A piercing gaze fixed on him. Like leering at a bug and waiting to strike. I'll never forgive you. What the hell? Damn it already. I need to hurry or else. Hey, are you alright? Noah calls out to him, snapping him out of his fixated trance. Colby nudges his head against Hugo, whining and with concern over his partner's well-being. Did you hear that just now? Hear yeah, what? That voice. It was so close to my ear, I... Is everything alright? Oh, I'm fine. Don't mind me. I'm just a bit winded from, from the trip. That's all. I'd be happy to make you coffee at the very least. If it's no trouble. No, not at all. It's the least I can do. Once again, the subtle uneasiness from Nina surfaces. But before Hugo can get a chance to look further into it, she walked off toward the front porch without saying another word. Are you sure you're alright? You sounded like you were choking earlier. I said I'm fine. Besides, we're already here. We can't back out now. Listen to me. I think you should... Noah abruptly cuts his lecture short as he notices Nina stopping by the front door. She stands there silently as if contemplating something. I know this may sound rude, but I didn't get a chance to know your names. Well, you were pretty out of it when you walked in. I'm really sorry about that. No worries. This is Detective Hugo Laurent. His assistant, Colby. And I'm his second assistant, Noah DeLeon. Huh. Seems so surreal, just like a cartoon. <laughs> Nina meekly smiles before turning away from them. I haven't been quite honest with you, Detective Laurent. Just like before, as if carefully choosing her next words, she decides that in this situation, words are not enough. You see for yourselves, you'll see for yourselves what I mean. And with that, Nina enters the house, leaving the three to follow behind. Hugo is about to enter through the foyer when he feels a tug on his arm. Don't forget what I told you. If something happens, let me know right away. You'll be the first to know. And with that, Noah releases his grip on Hugo. They proceed to head in, not knowing what awaits them beyond the door. Greeted with a brightly lit hallway, Hugo notes that the interior is just as grand. Adorned with floral accents and antique paintings, it exudes an elegant charm found only in a resplendent house such as this. However, Hugo notices something even more distinct than the splendor. The house is much more terrifying inside than out. Please come this way. Bracing themselves, they enter the dimly lit drawing room. At first glance, Hugo could not descend the silhouette situated at the far corner. However, on closer inspection, he now understands the reason for all of Nina's unsettling vagueness. Grandfather, we have guests. Sitting on the armchair is a young man. He is dressed in a white-collared dress-down shirt, tucked in with black slacks a black and black penny loafers. Staring only at the window, the young man sits there dazed with little acknowledgement of the people around him. Still, motionless, like a doll. Grandpa, these are the people I spoke of. This is Detective Laurent and his two assistants, Colby and Noah. They're going to help us. Even after introducing them to the head of the Mortimer estate, Hugo and Noah could not help but feel unnerved. The man before them supposed, is supposed to be frail and older than any of them. And yet here he remains, forever unchanging. Forever young. They've come a long way, so I'll be making some coffee. Would you also like some, Grandpa? The young man still does not reply back, never glancing at Nina or anyone else in the room, only fixated on the rain. I'll be sure to make a cup for you too. She then timidly gestures to Hugo and Noah back to the foyer, bearing more, bring, bearing more questions. The two follow Nina outside, but before they leave the drawing room, Hugo takes one last look at the young man. There's an all-too-familiar air about Henry Mortimer. His eyes... They're similar to his own. Whatever he must be looking, longing for, Hugo knows it will not end well. Nina. That man. Yes, he's my grandfather. The one I asked you all to watch over. I know this is hard to believe, but... Nina draws something out of her pocket. It's an antique picture of a young man with slick back hair wearing a luxurious suit. He appears to be poised and refined. A complete contrast to their current Henry Mortimer. 
This isn't much to go by, but I swear he's the same person. And why does he look so young? It happened a few nights ago. I was on my way to get a cup of tea when I heard a loud thud coming from my grandfather's room. I was worried that something fell over, so I went to go check. When I opened the door, I found him collapsed on the ground. I rushed to help him up, but when I did, he looked so different. So many things were rushing to my head, and yet he felt so familiar to me. He wore the same clothes that my grandpa wore that night. And his face, I recognised his face. He just looked younger. It was also the same night I found that letter. It was next to him, already opened. I'm sorry again for all of this. No matter who I went to, they said either something was either was wrong with me or my family. With everything going on, maybe they're right. The pools of water, the dripping sounds, the letter, and now this. Maybe my family really is cursed. They're not. Curses aren't real. Detective? I think we easily get too involved in believing that sort of thing exists. In reality, the ones who fixate on it, feed off it. Rumours, doubts, lies, all of those things are what they want to become real. Deep-rooted emotions like that can't possibly be healed or fixed right away. But like a curse, those emotions drag other people down with them. Personally, I think you were caught up in all of this. But I assure you, we'll see this through. For you and for your grandfather. Thank you. Good. Now, our first priority is to find out more about Lewis. Nina, the letter you showed us back at the agency. Do you have it with you? Uh, yes, it's here. Do you mind if I borrow it for a bit? I'll be sure to give it back. Of course. I'll check upstairs. Noah, you and Colby check the ground floor. Got it. Before they leave to do their own investigations, Hugo grabs a hold of Noah's shoulder. He leans in close enough for Nina not to not hear. Keep a close eye on Mr. Mortimer and Nina. Especially Nina. Okay. I'm counting on you. You too, boy. And with that, Hugo heads upstairs, starting his investigation. Mortimer Estate. After searching vigorously through each of the rooms, he knew that his findings would eventually lead him here. This is it. Hugo walks toward the nearest lampshade and opens it. Dimly illuminated, he sees the extent of how lavish this part of the house is. From customised drapes to the vintage furniture, everything here exudes that extravagance. But much like the interior Hugo has seen so far, he finds this one in particular reeks of it. Plastered from wall to wall, a sense of loom, a gloom lingers. It's as if the room itself is mouldering, despite its preserved nature. I need to hurry. I don't want to stay here for too long. Mortimer is say 11.50. How long was that? I don't remember what the last uh, time was. He searches and searches, still with no sign of anything. Not one thing pertaining to Lewis. Damn it, nothing? It's as if he cleared out everything. Just blank everywhere. No, it has to be here. I'm just missing something. He ponders again before remembering the letter. This is the only proof Lewis exists so far. I'll try to read it again. Maybe I overlooked it. As he takes the letter out from the envelope, he notices a change within. Bearing no foreboding thread at the bottom of the page, it looks just like a regular letter. What the... If you can't come, then I understand. It's pretty dreary after all. Ah, but if I can take one last favour of you, could you keep my locket? I know this is selfish of me, but I'd like for you to have it. I'd be happy knowing it's with you. Thank you for everything, Henry. Forever yours, Lewis. This is the same Lewis? I thought he was the cause of all this. I don't understand. Without warning, the sound of a click can be heard across the bedroom, as if something unlocked itself. Hugo turns around and sees at the foot of the bed a, ch a chest. Unlike the other furniture, its dark and rustic features have not been maintained well. Left to rot on its own, preparing himself, he opens the chest. Inside, scrambled together, are bunches of notebooks and small trinkets. Hugo continues to rummage through when he stumbles across an old newspaper article. Young man found dead by the lake. An unidentified young man was found on the morning of XXXXXXXX. Three days prior to his death, according to police. Ruled out as a suicide, police have claimed that the troubled youth drowned himself. This certainly is a tragic loss, an unfortunate event, indeed. XXXX comments. No claim of his body has been made yet. Lewis. 
By the corner of Hugo's eye, he spots a bright glint buried beneath the clutter. He reaches for it. A locket of brilliant gold shines unblemished, retaining a timeless luster. Inside, it safeguards a picture of a young man with glasses, smiling brightly. This must be the locket that he was talking about. It's so pretty. I'm surprised that it still shines like this. And this picture? Did he put this here? No. It might have been Henry. But why? Why would he store it away like this? What should I do? A choice? Oh my god, menu. Save. Go away, menu. Take the locket. I should probably hold on to this for now. Hugo is about to put everything back in the chest when he f feels a wet and cold sensation crawling up his leg. What? Water? A pool of water relentlessly spreads across the floor, already seeping into the chest. Damn it, no! Suddenly the lights shut off. A scream is heard, followed by a myriad of shouts. Hugo is about to call out to Noah, but stops at the sight of pale feet before him. Looming over him stands a tall and ominous figure. His face is shrouded in complete darkness, devoid of any human emotion. It appears as a young man, but Hugo knows that it's far from it. No, this very thing is trying to imitate a human form. Trying to be human. Hugo can only stare back. Paralyzed with fear, he is forced to watch the horror as it slowly creeps toward him. It's just like before, the sensation of someone staring at him from within. But this time, it's drawing nearer. Inching ever so closely, the words to call out to Colby or Noah fail to reach out. Lodged in his throat, he struggles in pain. With his breathing shallow, he tries to force his body to move. And then it stops. Looking down at Hugo, filled with nothing but malice and contempt, it speaks. Don't get in my way. All of a sudden, the door to the bedroom slams shut and the ent entity disappears. The tension from his body finally releases its agonizing grip and he gasps desperately for air. His vision blurred and breathing jagged, he staggered toward the door. He yanks at the handle several times, but it's tightly jammed. Fuck! <laughs> Noah! Colby! That's our first swear word. To his dismay, he is only greeted with silence at the other end of the door. Damn it! From a distance, he faintly hears the sounds of Colby's relentless barking as it gets further away from the house. Hugo rushes toward the window. He tries to pry it open. But just like the door, a heavy force prevents him from doing so. Fuck this! Frantically looking around the room, he spots a nearby chair. Without a moment sooner, Hugo grabs a chair, the chair and starts to strike the window. Bit by bit, the window cracks, get larger with each blow, splitting off smaller pieces. What the hell is this thing made of? Still trying to catch his breath, he musters all the strength that he has left for a final blow. Damn, you just break already! Clearing out the remaining glass shards, Hugo peers his head out to see the railing that he can, any railing he can grab hold of. However, he discovers instead that the wall adjacent is covered in ivy. Despite how heavy the rain has drastically become, he reaches out for it, grabbing a handful of the vines. Carefully, he climbs out the window, gripping tightly and making sure he doesn't lose his footing. Yet to his luck, the patch of vines he clutches starts to tear away from the wall. Out of desperation, he struggles to find his grip on another, but fails when his hand slips out of reach. Shit! Clamoring wildly as he loses his grip on the ivy, he crashes, lands down onto a thicket of bushes. Well, that's probably lucky. Air forced out of him. He heaves uncontrollably, trying to even his even out his breathing. But even that is laborious. An immense pain spreads across not only his back, but his entire body. God, I'm getting too old for this. Although his body screams out in pain, he forces himself up. There's still time. I can do this. I have to do this. With staggering feet and haggard breathing, he makes his way to the place where it all started. To the lake, where this tragedy starts and ends. Mortimer Estate 1201 Finally entering through the park, Hugo calls out to Colby and Noah. Colby! Noah! Where are you? He hears faintly the sounds of barking and echoes of people yelling in the distance. He rushes towards the echoes, guiding him through the downpour. With his heart racing and blood rushing to his head, he finds his way to the lake. Drawing closer, he sees Nina giving chase to her grandfather. Unfortunately, she doesn't get too far as Noah stops her. Grandpa, stop! Grandpa! Let me go, my grandpa, he's... Nina, please, it's dangerous, you'll get hurt too! I don't care, I... 
Don't want to lose anyone anymore. And so that instant, Hugo trudges against the water, pursuing in Nina's stead. Hugo? No, don't. Please fall on deaf ears. Not even the whines and worried cries of his partner could make him turn back. Determined, he trudges further in. Nearing the deep end, he sees Henry Mortimer gazing directly at the abyss. He looks even more frail and dishevelled, as if all the life he had been had been drained from him, surrendering it all to the lake. Before Henry could lean in, Hugo reaches out and tugs at his arm. Mr Mortimer, listen to me. Nothing is waiting for you down there, so please come back to the shore with me. Motionless and unresponsive, he still stares deeply into the water. There's so many things we cannot afford to lose in our lives, and you're one of them. To Nina, you're all she has left. She needs you, Mr. Mortimer. Hugo felt it. A slight jolt from Henry's arm, as if stirred by the mention of Nina. He slowly turns to face Hugo. Nina? However, just as a cruel and violent, as violent as the storm, Henry jerks back, wrenching his arm away from Hugo's hold on him. All of this is my fault. If only, if only I got to Lewis sooner, then none of this would have happened. Henry inches even closer to the edge. Lewis, I'm sorry. I should have... Should have what? Gone in his stead? Gone with him? You know that that wouldn't resolve anything. Not for you or Lewis. I... I read what he wrote to you those years ago. He understood if you didn't want to come and see him. But the thing is, Mr Mortimer, Lewis never thought anything less of you. The locket is proof of that. Lewis's locket. Yes, it's the symbol of his love for you. That's why you don't have to shoulder all the pain yourself anymore. We can talk about it. About you and Lewis. All of it. Together. Hugo extends not only his hand to him, but a promise. A promise that Henry had yearned for so long. A way to forgive himself. He hesitates at first. What fool believes in a deserved forgiveness? Such a thing doesn't exist. And yet, despite everything, Hugo still reaches out to him. To a stranger. Maybe he can be forgiven. Just as he was about to reach out for Hugo, a hand slithers around Henry's instead. Its arms unnaturally contort around him, while its head perches on his shoulder. This thing. This Lewis is no longer pretending to be human. With piercing cold green eyes, it glares directly at Hugo, mocking him. Cursing him. Wishing nothing but despair. We can be saved. We can be forgiven. There is only one true way out of this. I will share with you the most happiest of endings. Before Hugo could reach out for Henry's hand, he disappears into the water. Mr. Mortimer! Without hearing the anguished cries and desperate pleas, Hugo dives in after him into the abyss. Okay. Plunging into icy waters, Hugo feels shocks running rampant through his body, like spikes continuously piercing from his legs to the tips of his fingers, fiercely and unyielding. His chest tightens and his heart races as he begins to kick his legs, hoping whichever way he goes, he'll find his way to Henry. Swimming deeper and deeper in, he sees faintly a figure slowly descending into the darkness. As he finally gets closer to Henry, long snake-like arms stretch across the void and grab Hugo's neck, violently squeezing all the air out from him. He tries desperately to wrench its hands away, but with each struggle, Hugo's movements begin to weigh heavier and heavier. Lewis, where are you, Lewis? It's looking for Lewis? Digging deep in his coat pockets, he grasps tightly in his hands the locket that Henry keep, kept and has, has long forgotten. Holding it out as it shines ever so brightly in the dark. Uh, there you are. It releases its grip on Hugo and instead reaches out for the locket. Taking this as a chance, he drops the chain and kicks it with all his might to grab Henry's arm. With his heart burning and his body screaming, he swims, swims desperately to the surface. Almost there. I just have to... As the lights from the surface begin to blur, Hugo makes one last attempt to reach for it. With his limbs worn out and his energy spent, this is all he can do. Before he loses his consciousness, he notices a figure swimming towards them getting closer and closer. 
and then everything fades to black. Drifting along with what feels like an endless sea, Hugo courses through wave after wave, not knowing where he's going, or care caring for that matter. Well, he knows that he's very, very tired. How long has it been since he had a good night's rest? Ah, <sighs> it's been too long. Maybe I should take a rest now. I'd like that so much. I agree that you deserve it, but not here. I'm sorry for startling you. I just wanted to see you before I go. Lewis? You've done so much for me and Henry. Thank you. No worries. From a far off distance, a voice cries out to him, beckoning for him to come back. Well, I guess this is it. Take care, Hugo. With his eyes closed and his sense still returning, he feels the constant tugs and licks of a certain bloodhound, whining as it tries to wake up his partner. Hugo! He also hears another familiar voice, too annoyingly close for comfort. Eyes shot right open, he jerks up. Confused, Hugo looks around before he coughs up the remaining water in his lungs. Are you alright? No one starts to pat his back while Colby continues to whine over Hugo. What happened? Where's Mr. Mortner? He's safe. So is Nina. They're both okay. The police and the ambulance should be arriving soon. Thank goodness. Isn't there more that you have to say to me? Instead of, thank goodness, I swear you don't listen to a damn word I say. I'm sorry, Noah. Exhausted, he lets out a sigh. Then he continues to pat Hugo's back aggressively when someone approaches them. Detective Lauren? Oh, Nina! There's someone I want you to meet. Behind her stands an elderly man. Frail in stature, he timidly looks to the side pensively as he ponders to himself. Although his youth has long faded, his eyes are what catches Hugo's attention. They're no longer pe a piercing and vicious green. Only eyes, just like Nina's. Hello, Mr. Mortimer. Detective? I never got a chance to say goodbye to him. I always thought about it every day. What if Lewis lived on in this world? What if he stayed a little longer with me? It's because of that constant mindset I dragged everyone down. And kept hurting not only me, but Nina especially. I was the one who kept hurting her. This one, the one to blame for all of this. But you, someone that I've never met, so went out of your way to save me. Not knowing my burdens or my faults. Thank you. Hugo reaches out to Henry and smiles brightly at him. It's my pleasure, sir. But before he lets go, Henry tugs at Hugo's hands one last time. I hope that someday you too will overcome it. Next day. Well, good morning, Hugo. You're bright and early. Morning. With much fervor and haste, Hugo resumes writing on his notepad. Although by closer inspection, he looks like he's going to combust any minute. Are you writing up the report? Without looking up, Hugo responds back. Yeah, for the most part. You still need to write yours too. I will. But since I haven't had breakfast yet, and I don't like eating by myself, Let me guess. Two is better than one? Bingo! Wow, Hugo. You're really catching on. I'm so proud of you. Ah, oh, shut it, will you? I swear. If only I hadn't fallen off that goddamn window, maybe the report would have been shorter. Before Noah could even begin to cut the bacon, he pauses at the mention of Hugo's report. Oh yeah, by the way, mind telling me what happened to the Mortimer's window? Um... I broke it. Well, that's obvious to me. What I don't understand is, why is it broken? Do you know how much it costs to repair a window like that? I know, I know. It was really dumb of me. I'm sorry. Besides, I told Mr. Mortimer about it before we left. Honestly, I was expecting an earful from him. And also the bill. And? Surprisingly enough, he said it was okay. So what, you just called, called it a day after all that? Thank you so much, Mr. Mortimer. You broke it. You pay for it. Would you chill? Of course I'll pay for it. But each time I kept insisting, you just shrugged it off. You said that we already went through a lot for them. So this was nothing in comparison. <sighs> you know what? He's right. After all we went through, I deserve at least a nap. Hugo puts down his pen and proceeds to head for the couch. <coughs> Colby follows after them. Wait, what about breakfast? I'll eat it later. It's nap time now. 
Heavily sighing, Noah sets aside the food on his desk and joins the other two at the couch. I'm getting old. I mean, you are old. Shut it. Colby whines, asking for head scratches. Ah, sorry, boy. Silently, Hugo scratches the back of Colby's ears as he leans closer to Noah. You know, I'm glad you came along yesterday. Oh, what's this? Are you getting chummy with me now? Call it chummy or whatever, but I really mean it. If you hadn't saved us back there. Like I told you before, I'll be there whenever you get yourself into reckless shit. Besides, didn't you say this was nap time? Get some rest. You deserve it. You too. A calming silence fills the room as the three fall deeper into sleep. No big parties or celebrations. Just each other's comfort and sharing the small but rewarding night's rest. Good end. A night's rest. Bam! We finished the game. And it's only been 40 minutes, but I want to jump in and change that one choice. Which is obviously going to get us the bad end, but I'm curious. Now I'm going to hit the uh, skip button. Uh, until something new comes up. Or maybe it'll be new straight away, I don't know. I think it's best to put it back for now. Alright, this looks like new stuff. So we're back at the swamp. I've had enough. Lewis is waiting for me. He's waiting for me to come home. Before Hugo could reach out for Henry's hand, he disappears into the water. Mr. Mortimer! Without hearing the anguished cries and desperate pleas, Hugo dives after him. Into the abyss. Plunging into icy waters, Hugo feels shock running rampant through his body, like spikes continuously piercing from his legs to the tips of his fingers, fiercely and unyielding. His chest tightens and his heart races as he begins to kick his legs, hoping whichever way he goes, he'll find his way to Henry. Swimming deeper and deeper in, he sees faintly a figure slowly descending into the darkness. As he finally gets closer to Henry, long snake-like arms stretch across the void and grab Hugo's neck, violently squeezing all the air out from him. He tries desperately to wrench his hands away. But with each struggle, Hugo, Hugo's movements begin to weigh heavier and heavier. Water filling his lungs and his vision starts to blur. The cold numbness spreads. Tired and motionless, he watches on as the abyss draws near, swallowing him, embracing him. Let's share this happy ending together. Bad end. A mermaid cell. Well, that was quick. I like the, uh, the ending bit there. Very spooky. Anyway, that's it. That's still water. We did it all in one go. I really, really like the um, the art style of it though. Very unique. The character art and the backgrounds. Very cool. Very cool. But yeah, that'll be it. Tell me what you think about it in the comments. It was very short, obviously, but you know, it's free. And there's only one choice in it, which was kind of surprising, but still. It's a pretty major choice and picking the wrong one gets you dead pretty much straight away. So it's pretty much just a bad end option in the middle. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for taking it out with me and I'll see you in the next one.